someone says, oh, you race a Mini, you know, I used to have a Mini, I learned to drive in a Mini, oh, my first car was a Mini. Everyone seems to me to have a Mini story to tell. The whole thing started for me when I was a small boy riding around in the back of my mum's Mini 850. Any time that my mum's brothers were doing repairs on it, I wanted to be there watching what they were doing. It just seemed to me to be the thing to do, to want to understand how it worked, why, why it did that. And I love the idea of getting the overalls on. That, that, that was it, I was hooked already. So this Mini is 1963 vintage. Uh, when I got it, it was a terrible rusty mess. So it is a race car, but it's also been a restoration project, really. I really like the mix of those two things. I love Mini, so I've enjoyed restoring it to its former glory, but adding the twist of making it into a 19366 uh, specification racing car. The sewage crisis and uh, the sort of, uh, desire to make uh, more fuel efficient cars led to BMC uh, seeking to make a small family car. So out it came as a, as a sort of low capacity, fuel efficient, small family car. And this set the tone for the next 50 years for car manufacturing. It's quite amazing. The heritage of Mini as a competition car is enormous. John Cooper was a world champion Formula One car constructor. He's taken his idea to produce a performance Mini, the Mini Cooper. So they build a performance Mini and it's spectacularly successful. They then decide, let's take this car to uh, Europe and uh, let's go rallying. The headlines are, off they go to the Monte Carlo Rally and Mini wins the Monte Carlo Rally, which was quite frankly remarkable. In my first job, talking to like-minded people about our interesting cars, as you do as a 17-year-old, it came to my attention that there was Mini racing out there. And once I read about Mini 7, I was like, right, this is it, I've got to do this. And my mate Bob was, you know, he's like, yep, I'm, I'm with you, let's do this. Uh, so I joined Mini 7 Racing Club, and the newsletter arrived. Oh, it's a car for sale, it's got a blown up engine, perfect. We went and bought that car, it, it was cheap, we just screwed it all back together. The bits that were broken managed to you know, fashion a form of repair. But we got it back together and fired it up and I can so remember the excitement when it actually burst into life, you know. This is a transverse engine and when when the Mini appeared as a road car in 1959, the transverse engine was largely unthought of, you know, and the gearbox is underneath the engine and it's sharing the same oil. Mini sort of popularised front wheel drive, um, so it was a revolutionary car. 28th of October 1984, we rocked up our brand hatch, newbies. It was just brilliant. The quick boys were doing 59 second laps, you know, and it was a 10 lap race, so I realised that I needed to be doing at least 66 second laps in order not to get lapped, which was my target. And I did manage to lap under 66 seconds, but I obviously wasn't consistent enough because I did get lapped in the end. Uh, but that actually, that led to me being pictured in motoring news. Uh, <laughs> from that moment, you know, the pattern of my life was set, really. Coming out to a race meeting, preparation is key. So much of your success is built on what happens away from the circuit. You might think it's only a simple old mini, but to find the last tenth out of it, the last tenth of a percent of performance, you're looking for very, very tiny, tiny margins. The people that look the most successful at race meetings appear to be the luckiest because everything seems to be very easy. But of course, what you need to appreciate is that the luck has been generated in the workshop hours that are spent prior to the race meeting itself. When the car leaves this workshop, absolutely everything has been done. So you arrive at the circuit with nothing at all to do except pour in some fresh fuel, uh, set the tyre pressures, and then we're ready to race. I suspect that for me, the time in the seat driving the car amounts to 1% of what motor racing is. 
track walk, you know, it's just an integral part of it, really. It just saves you from wasting time getting your eye in at the beginning of the driving session, really. So this is just to remember where the circuit goes, look at the little nuances, the little bumps, the crests, the curbs that, you know, are, are your visual guides to where you're trying to be when you're driving the car. You know, it gives you a bit of understanding and, you know, you'll see if they've laid any new tarmac anywhere, which might have altered the grip levels, see if there's any water on it. We're looking for tents, maybe not even the whole tents, a little bit. You're looking for tiny margins everywhere. The line through this corner and the reading of the road is absolutely critical. So I'm just, I'm, I'm looking a long way into the distance and just, I can see where the grass is worn out on the right hand side of the road. I know that's where I'm going to go myself. I don't actually want to go on that dirty bit. I want to pick the mud up because I'm shortly going to be on the brakes. Okay, this is probably the best part of this circuit. I'm walking exactly where the car's going and I'm looking towards the apex on the left hand side, which is my sort of trigger point for braking. And you can brake really quite hard. There's not very much runoff area here. There's no gravel traps. So it's not anywhere to make a mistake. But you kind of gather the car in and down a couple of gears, turn sharp right here. Now there's a bit, I suppose, where you'd probably say you're earning your money, you know, because the car's dancing a bit now. You're hard on the brakes. You're trying to get the thing to turn in. So you want a bit of action from the rear, a bit of oversteer just so that you don't have to put too much work through the front tires. You must be right here, you know, not just on the white line, but the other side of the white line, using that extra bit of tarmac there. The curbs are ours as well. You've got to hold for a little while in order that you can make the exit work for you. And by now, you know, you're hard on the gas and it's oh, flat out that way. When I started, I never had the slightest idea that I was going to win any races. Certainly not any championships, and I don't think I thought for a minute that it would last as long as this. I just wanted to do it, I wanted to be out there doing it. So really, right at the very beginning, it was mission accomplished because I was out there. And I, I think I was actually quite surprised to find that I had a competitive nature. And then I kind of learned this whole art of racing, which Frankly, I'm still learning stuff now. I'm not confrontational by nature. But the art of racing is about getting yourself to the front and defeating your rivals. And, and that means that uh, you, know, you have to dominate the racetrack. Once you've got it to the front, you've got to prevent other people from coming past you. Now, in the one sense, it'd be great if you could just sort of stretch away and extend the lead and then, yeah, just do demonstration driving. But in reality, that doesn't really happen with mini racing. The cars are you know, very unaerodynamic uh, and they sort of, sort of tend to hold together in, in groups so that you'll see a really close, hard fought race. So the guy that's going to do the winning is likely going to have to assert himself over the right over his rivals, which means you have to dominate the track. You have to prevent people from getting to where they want to get because you need to keep that bit covered. So that is quite confrontational in a way but politely so. You know, you can close the door, and as long as you close the door before someone's halfway through the door, that's fine. You know, if you don't want to come down the inside, you use the right-hand side of the track before the corner. Ever so simple, and then they can go down the left-hand side, and if they're brave enough to go around the outside, that's off, fair play. Yeah, keeps you thinking. It's exciting. I like winning, because obviously it's the ultimate objective. One of my greatest weaknesses I think when I first started racing was that I was too content not to win and I remember thinking that Chris Lewis who was one of my early severest rivals and he was destroyed if he didn't win he was beside himself as long as I'd been in the race and played a major part in the in the battle I was content with that I really enjoyed that but I realized that no no that's actually not that's not that's not going to bring enough wins I think I've got a balanced relationship with winning. I'm not obsessed. I like winning, you know, and I'm going to go to Goodwood with, um, with every intention of battling for that victory. Obviously, I am a bit embarrassed getting all my trophies out, but that's because you guys insist. <laughs> <laughs> if you get the preparation right, all the homework right, a bit of luck and it all runs your way on the day, then, you know, that's a good day's racing. You feel you're in command of the machine. It does absolutely everything you want it to do. It does it in a way that everything's happening quite slowly. You know, there's no, there's no surprises involved. So you're all over the mirrors. Obviously, you're in front at this point. You know, there's, no, there's nothing in to, to, to see in front of you other than 
an empty racetrack in the next corner. You know you've got everything covered and you're just kind of, you know, marking off time, just, you know, putting your car in the right place, controlling the race, controlling the track. It's a terribly straightforward, smooth procedure. You are just in charge. Everything's right, you feel the car, you you know, you can you can feel it through the seat of your pants, literally. It's a perfect moment.